And we're back with a fresh edition of The Conversation. An absolute pleasure to have the one, the only, Leanne Sanderson joining me and Shaka Leanne. I mean, you're someone that we've definitely wanted to talk to for some time now. Given the fact that you would know our audiences in the US so well at ESPN, but then of course you're a child of here, of England, where I'm at right now, and with Jamaican parentage too, so even better. And just to continue this conversation, because as Shaka and I keep saying, um, we, we've reached a point where we no longer want racism or the fight against racism to just be a flavor of the month, to just be something that you put up for one or two months or see players taking the knee for one or two months and then after we're back to square one, you know, until something else tragic happens. Um, but for you, I guess let's just start with taking it back to summer 2020. You know, 2020 was a difficult year for all of us with the ongoing coronavirus pandemic but i still think it was such a monumental year in terms of this fight against racism unfortunately all of it started with the tragedies that we saw with george floyd brianna taylor just amongst others you i believe were in the states when when that happened were you yeah first and foremost i'd just love to say thank you for having me it's an absolute pleasure of mine to be on the show yeah. and uh, i've lived in america now for 10 years apart from when i signed for juventus in italy and um, yeah, it was obviously, it was a terrible time. And I think it didn't matter where you was in the world. It affected everybody for many mm -hmm. different reasons. And, you know, growing up, my dad's black, my mom's white. I grew up in a fantastic family. And it's something, you know, I've had to do with my whole life, whether it be you're followed around the shop because of the color of your skin or mm -hmm. you're going out somewhere having to feel like you have to wear nicer clothes because you don't want to be judged. And that's something that you didn't even realize you even did until all these things were brought to fruition. So it's almost yeah. like I used to say to my dad when I was younger, dad, why are they following us around this shop? And he used to never tell me the reason. But as I got older and I started to get followed around the shop, I then understood. And it's one of those things where you kind of live with and you're thinking that's not okay to be judged by the color of your skin or your gender or your sexuality. So with regards to what happened in 2020, I think, which obviously wasn't that long ago, I think it made everybody else wake up and realize what we've been going through our whole lives. And I think a lot of people didn't realize how, in depth it affects them because it's something we don't necessarily talk about all the time the fact that we're on this show talking about it yes it's not a nice conversation but it's important and it's also very inspirational to be able to talk to you know fellow people of color about this subject because it's something that we don't necessarily feel like we can speak about and i think with regards to george floyd and what happened to him and the murdering of george floyd it's amazing to me to see the amount of people that have woken up since then not quite mm -hmm. sure why it's taken that to happen but i've had messages from people with regards to what happened with um, myself and Ennio Raluca at the Football Association mm -hmm. and from, from former teammates that have actually said, you know, we didn't realise how in-depth this meant and what it meant to you. And it was a bit strange to me to, to receive messages four years later after something that happened with a manager that had been proven that he was racist in what he said. And mm -hmm. now four years later, it's taken the murdering of George Floyd for some people to wake up and see, you know, I couldn't really understand the correlation between the two. And I'll take the apology but I'm not really sure why now people have woken up finally. Yeah, that, 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 that's a thing for me, Leanne. I, I, I so agree with, with everything you said, and, and you said a lot, and, and you talk about being followed around the shops or how you have to dress if you're going to certain places or how you dress differently if you're going to certain places just because you don't want to uh, attract that attention. And, and I think some of those behaviours, are, are learned behaviours within the black community um, for, for a number of, uh, of reasons most probably most likely for, for, for self-protection it's something i speak about when when i go into shops i never have my hands in my pockets mm -hmm. i i always stop if i'm going into a mall or big department store i stop on the security cameras and look at the camera as though just to say to the guy sitting wherever he is i'm here i'm not trying to hide any hide from you i'm not trying to hide anything and and these just some of these small instances just kind of shows how we, as members of the black community, have to curb our own behaviors in not drawing attention or in an effort to show our innocence because we know from the time we step in your door, we're assumed guilty. And, and that speaks to, to some of our cultural behaviors, but um, to, to a bigger picture. And, and I'm with you in that, why did it take 2020? Why did it take a pandemic and George Floyd to some of our closest friends to, re to recognize what we've been doing, what we've having to cope with, what our community has been complaining about? 
and, and for me, if we get anything out of 2020, if we get anything out of our continued conversations in 2021, or just this, this series, it's, it's an, an understanding from the wider communities as to what we've been dealing with and a recognizing from them as to why did it take this for you and to, take, not, to and take it, notice. Shaka, it's not even you being paranoid. It's actually a real thing. Like if you shared that story like you're sharing mm. now, when you walk into a store, people can't quite believe it. And it's not because you're being paranoid. It's actually a real thing. Like when I go on a flight, I know if I wear a tracksuit, I'm going to get stopped. And I get yeah. stopped in the most ridiculous places. I don't even share most of the story. Sometimes I do, but like I've been stopped when I'm about to walk on the flight and I've had someone grab me by the arm and walk me off the flight and everybody's staring at me like I'm a criminal. Mm. And then they start going through my stuff. And it's not even, I know the immigration that are doing their job, but I'm talking when it's not even in that moment. And I don't yeah. share mm -hmm. these stories all the time because it's like, but why? So then I think, well, I just want to say peace. So I'm going to dress a little bit nicer when I'm flying on a 12 hour flight from LA. Who really wants to dress in a nice outfit? Mm -hmm. You want to be in your pajamas and a tracksuit. Yeah, but you want to be covered, to right? Yourself, mm -hmm. Right? You have to think, well, actually, and it's something you actually don't even realize you have to do, but you do. Yeah. And I mean, just echoing that sentiment too, Shaka and I have shared our experiences a number of times as well from ESPN. Like, obviously, growing up in Jamaica and Shaka in Trinidad, I was saying how we've never really had to um, be confronted by, by racism, as it is, say, here in England or in the United States. You know, I've never felt like I needed to identify with a certain group until I moved first to the States when I started working with ESPN and obviously now to England. Now, you know, living in, in West London, too, I've had people ask me if I'm, you know, a dog walker or a babysitter. Uber drivers that pick me up, um, coming from Lords as well, when I'm covering cricket, they ask me if I'm coming up a shift from behind the bar. Like they never think journalist or anything, you know? And I feel like before I would, I would like reluctantly laugh it off and say, LOL, no, I'm no, I'm actually a journalist. And then they'd be like, Oh wow, blah, blah, blah. And I would entertain it. Now I don't. Now it really does set me off. And I feel like it should have set me off this badly from before. But the George Floyd thing, I think something clicked in all of us, Leanne. For you, what was it? Why did it hurt more? Why has it affected us all like this? Do you know what? I don't think it's affected me any worse than other situations. I think other people's reactions have yeah. what been has affected me, whether that be good or bad. Because like I said previously, I'm not quite sure why it's taken that for other people to then reach out to me to apologize for something that happened four years ago when they didn't stick up for me and myself and Enero Reluco. Why would that be the situation? So am I surprised that this happened? Unfortunately not. I'm not surprised. And it did make me feel sick to my stomach when you see the video of George Floyd. And no matter how many times you see it, it feels worse every single time. But I think for me, the biggest thing has been the reaction of other people, good and bad. Like I said, I think some companies, production companies have realized, actually, we don't have any diversity on our, on our staff or whether that be on TV, whether that be in a club. I mean, if you look at the women's WSL in England, the Women's Football League, Professional League, there's hardly any ethnic minority players. How can that be? How can there only be mm. about three players of color in the league that does not make any sense that can't be right managers coaching people are not willing to even go for a job because they know they're not going to get it whereas now i think people are finally realizing actually we do need more diversity i do think some companies are doing it to tick a box but at this moment in time we will take it and it gives people the opportunity to go for these jobs because in previous time people haven't had the ability to even go for it because you just think well i'm not going to get it and that's not how i've been raised you know i've been very lucky. I've been a professional footballer since I was 14 years old. I love my life. You know, I don't like negativity, but I just think other people, it's finally made other people wake up as to what it is to walk a day in the life of people like us. And let me, I'll counter that, uh, Leanne, in that the George Floyd murder affected me deeply. And yeah. just as, as, as the father of, of, black, uh, of five black children, um, I started an organization so recently, Red Card, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, almost as, as, as a promise to deliver a better world to my kids. And then all of a sudden, 2020 happened. And the George Floyd murder played off on, in, in front of our eyes and every screen that, that was available to us. And the, my initial reaction to that was a, a feeling that I had failed in the most basic of promises to my children. And that was hard for me to accept. Uh, I, I then had a conversation with uh, Leroy Rossinia, former black footballer, black manager, um, 
himself who said, we have to see this as a relay. We're handing the baton off to the next generation. Uh, and we have to hand it off in the best possible position that we can. And, and uh, give them the confidence and the tools that they need to run the next leg and hope that that next leg is the last. And I, I say that in, in asking you, Leanne, given your own career as a footballer, given the next steps that you're taking in working with the media and the barriers that you continue to break down, do you feel an added responsibility in how you address or react to either personal incidents, experiences of your own, or to wider issues that we, we're discussing, do you feel a greater responsibility as a trailblazer? Do you, in, in recognizing that the path that you're blazing for a, a, a young girl somewhere in the world that you may never meet, is that something that, plays, that comes into your mind? Yeah, I think so. I've been very fortunate to have been raised with integrity in the sense that like, I am very much like my mum and dad believe in everything that I do. We have conversations, open and honest conversations, but I'm a big believer in integrity. And what I've realized is a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is going to be very selfless things. So I'm going to put myself out there. And at times I think it's cost me opportunities. You know, I think it's cost me my England career being outspoken. I think things like that, but I have to be okay with that. And I sleep at night knowing that I've done the right thing. Now, I'm not perfect, nobody is, but I do think that being a trailblazer, you almost become selfless even more because you're like, I'm doing all this work for the opportunity for a younger girl, like your daughters, like anybody's daughter, mm -hmm. even a son, to be able to be in a position where, you know, they can look at me and think, similar to Kamala Harris, you know, that could be me one day. And I think that is what keeps me going. For all the abuse that I get, from people on social media and different things, it will not stop me. Yes, it's hurtful at times, but at the same time, it's a small minority of people. I get a lot of people, I had someone message me today saying I saved their life just because I responded to them when they were saying they wasn't feeling very good. Now that's just a person I've never met in my life. So to reiterate your point, Shaka, there's a lot of people that I, I can affect as we all can here today um, and use your platform to be able to help people. And that's literally something that I really enjoy doing. And I've noticed that sometimes you're not going to get that pat on the back that you might need sometimes. And that's not why I do it. But I think some pe people realize your, your work, you're doing more than you realize. Just because they might not say it, they see it. So if I can help anybody, then I can. And I'm just very blessed and lucky that my parents support me 150%. And I'm exactly like them when it comes to integrity. And, and full disclosure here, um, two of the young girls uh, that you affect uh, are, are <laughs> Two of my own daughters, as, as I mentioned, I've got five kids, four girls. The youngest two uh, play, play football. And we were fortunate enough just to bump into you outside Gillette Stadium one, yeah, one summer's Boston. day. And, uh, I, and, and thank you very much for that. You, you have no idea um, the, the kind of effect that that has on, on young ladies as, as my girls were then. Uh, and made me a cool dad for, for a little while. <laughs> they, they, that they, was they, great. It didn't last very long. They, I, I, I messed that up somehow, but at least I was cool dad for a little bit. So I, for me, thank you very no, much. No, I mean, it was my pleasure because I, I was, saw you walking through the car park and I was like, that's Shaka Hislop. And then I remember I came over and I was like, we're in Boston. I mean, what are the chances yeah. in the Patriots car park? So then it was absolute pleasure of mine. I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> and then Leanne, I mean, just especially for some of those that may not uh, know exactly how you got started, obviously being here um, in England. And, and I say, unfortunately, like you had, you had two mountains stacked against you, obviously one being, you know, mixed race as well and having black, but also being a woman, you know, trying to, I mean, there's so many male dominated fields, period, but in, in sport, in football as well. What was, I guess, a bit of that journey uh, like for you? Because we've spoken, of course, I mean, as Shaka says, he's constantly trying to balance protecting your children from what we know is the disgusting racism that plagues this world, but also trying to make sure that they're aware of it so that they know what to do if and unfortunately when they do encounter it. What was that dynamic like um, for your mother and father? Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because I started playing for a boys team when I was five years old. There was no girls around that played. I was the only girl on an all-boys team. And I was just this young, naive kid that just loved playing football. I didn't see myself any differently. 
My mm. teammates loved me, but I used to come into contact with a lot of other team um, people I'd be playing against that would say these horrible comments. Parents on the other team, they would say horrible things that I won't repeat. So I used to hear them and just think, I'm just going to play football. Whereas it did used to affect my mum and dad a lot because I'm their, I'm their little girl. Do you know what I mean? I'll always be yeah. their little girl. So to hear those things wasn't nice. But I think the positive thing now is that there's more girls that are playing football. There's more females involved in football. And there are women's specific teams. Because when I was growing up, I always knew at the age of five years old, I wanted to be a professional footballer. And people say to me, how did you know that? I just knew. And there was not going to be anything that stopped me. But there wasn't even a women's professional league. <laughs> so mm -hmm. when I originally got scouted for Arsenal in South East London, I actually got scouted for the boys team because it wasn't until I got closer, they approached my parents. It was an absolute honor to be scouted for Arsenal boys, but I got closer and they saw my little braid at the back of my hair and they're like, actually, she's a girl. And I could see, they said because of my ability at that time, because there wasn't any girls playing at the standard yeah. that I was at. But my hope was that it doesn't mean it, just because you're good, you should be accepted. Anybody should be able to play, but I just had very thick skin, but it did used to affect my mum and dad a lot because the things that the parents would say, and they'd come up to me after the game and then have respect for me because I was good, but I just didn't really care because I was like, I just love playing the game. It's, I mean, it, it's heartbreaking to, to hear and recognise that adults, other parents, and, and what they have to say to a, a five-year-old on, on the field, regardless. I, I mean, I, that, that is, is impossible for me to, 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 to fathom. Um, but a lot of that abuse now has, has turned online. And we've been having those, those discussions uh, about a lot of the abuse that Marcus Rashford uh, and Anthony Martial, Raheem Sterling have faced. I was, I was on a, a course similar to this and um, speaking with Karen Kearney and, and the abuse that, that she has, has come, come under because she's a woman commentating uh, on, on male sport. How, how has um, social media impacted some of, those, some of that abuse, some of the discussions? And what's next in terms of addressing that online abuse? Yeah, I think, obviously, I'll, I'll give you a bit of background on myself. Like, the more that I'm doing, the more abuse that I seem to get. And obviously, a lot of these yep. things are male predominantly followed accounts. That's the truth. The, the companies yep. that I'm working for. And I think what people don't realize, I've learned to not let it affect me as much. But then there could be a day where you might not be feeling good, you know, and you shouldn't go on your phone. I don't even look at my uh, phone during a show now. If I'm live on air, I don't look at my phone anymore because I thought it could impact my answers mm -hmm. I'm giving. It could make you start to feel because it does make you feel a little bit sick um, because I get, you know, I'm, I'm half black. I'm a woman and I'm gay. So it's almost mm. like you tick all the wrong boxes, but all the right boxes. So, but mm. at the end of the day, I'm not going anywhere. I think it depends on your circumstance. If it, is, if it affects your mental health, which it can do, I think that these people, they have nothing better to do but to abuse people like myself and other people. But at the same time, I'm not going to let them win by coming off there. But I can see why some people do, because you have to think, well, what is this doing to impact me? A professional yeah. footballer shouldn't be going out to do their job and then coming on and checking their phone and getting abuse, any type of abuse. If you don't think I'm a good player, absolutely fine. But why do you have to talk about my gender, my sexuality, my race? Why do you have to go to those levels? But when they go to those levels, nothing's done about it. So these things affect my, my mum a lot more because she'll go on social media and she'll check it and she gets her upset. And I'm like, mum, look, for every hundred tweets you get, you might get four that are not good. And this is the problem. You remember those four because they're usually pretty bad. Mm. So yeah. I try to think, actually, I do get a lot of nice messages, but why people feel the need to pick up their phone and attack? If I don't like somebody, not everyone's going to like you, are they, unfortunately? But mm. if I don't like somebody, I'm not going to go and tell them and pick up my phone and think, actually, I'm going to go and tell this person I don't like them, but to the core. And now it's like they have your telephone number, isn't it? It's like giving mm. someone your telephone number because everybody's creatures of habit. We all check our social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and whatever, but more needs to be done from these companies because they have enough money to put people in place that can take it away before you've even seen it. If I put up yeah. a song, it's taken down straight away if it's yeah. not copyright. Mm. So why is it that you can be abused and you report it, then you get a generic response that says, um, it's not harmful or, offen or offensive, but it's because it's a computerized response. You couldn't yeah. get any more harmful and offensive than the messages that have been sent. So I think there needs to be more done. I know a lot of people disagree, but I do think you should have to have some kind of identification 
to be on these platforms. I really do. Mm. I don't think you should be able to be anonymous completely because it's getting out of hand. And now it almost feels like it's becoming a trend. Every weekend, a footballer or a celebrity, it doesn't have to just be a footballer, is getting abused. And it isn't nice. Do governments have a role to play in that? Yeah, definitely. I think it also comes down to willingness to want to do more and to change because it's all very well sending out a statement saying we need to do this we need to but what are you doing behind the scenes i think a lot of it is lip service where they say we need to do this we need to do that we'll do something then what more needs to happen before something is done because i don't want the players to have to come off of social media but that's what's going to happen because i don't go on my social media anywhere near as much as i did because i'm like i don't want to see people writing mean things to me if you don't like me like i said if you don't like me as a pundit you're absolutely fine to your opinion but why do you have to take it to the levels that you do? So the government and the governing bodies need to do way more than they are because it shouldn't need for it to come to the way it's got to now, out of hand almost, for something to be done. And I mean, it takes, like you said, it takes one thing for you to not like um, the way somebody plays or, you know, a comment that they've made on television to actually pick up your phone and go to a total stranger because that's exactly what majority of these people are. Um, and, and tell them you don't like them. But it also takes a, an extra darker place to go when you feel like the way that you counteract this person's play or, or I suppose attack them is, takes you to a homophobic, a racist, and a sexist place. Do you feel like now we're seeing more incidents of racism, homophobia, and sexism, or is it just because now these social media um, platforms have given them that platform? I think it's a whole, it's a whole, I don't want to get into politics, but I think when you've got leaders in the position of power in the world that are outrightly racist and homophobic and the things that they say, it almost gives people the right to think they can say that too. Now, yep. is it, I always say you're not born racist, you're not born homophobic, this is tall. And you cannot, you can't stop people from saying these things that they've been taught inside their own home. Just because there's campaigns and stuff, there's only so much you can do. Maybe you can try to change people's perceptions of someone like me, and I'll give you one example. I went to Qatar. I've been there twice. One of the best experiences of my life. If I'd have listened to people, I never would have gone there. Because people yeah. were saying, well, they don't like people like you there. They don't like people like you. What are you going to do? If I got there and people were mean to me, I would have left straight away. What the people, people were abusing me from, some people from the LGBTQ community were selling, saying to me, why are you going there? You're going against us. Well, did they see that I'm in the Khalifa Stadium running a football camp for about 100 girls? That was never been done before. I'm meeting with people in Qatar that people like me, they say, don't get anywhere near them. But you have to sometimes be able to willing to put yourself out there to change people's perceptions of what people like me are. That's not putting myself in danger, but you have to do what you've got to do. So at the end of the day, there are these people in the world. You cannot, like I said, you are not born racist, homophobic and prejudiced. Unfortunately, people are. But I do think that with regards to people being more outwardly spoken about it, it's always been there. People often say, you know, oh, America's this. I've lived in America for 10 years. I absolutely love it. I love where I'm from in England, but I love America. It changed my life moving to America. It really did for the better. And I think sometimes in England, people often say, we don't have that in our country. We don't have that yeah. in England. It doesn't exist in England. Well, what happened when like Obama Yang got a banana thrown at him? That was in England. Mm. So these things are happening. So more needs to be done about it. But like I said, it's a hard one because what can you do when people are having these ideas and thinking they can bring them and say them. And this goes back to on the social media. If you're allowed to be anonymous, then people can say whatever they want because nothing's going to be done. Heavier fines, police getting involved and stuff like that. It has to happen. It sounds extreme, but it does. And I mean, one of the things too, I mean, just hearing you speak, and obviously all of us come from, you know, sports, um, I, I suppose as a background, although I obviously was nowhere near the levels that you guys have gotten to being representing your countries. But um, one of the things that we hear so much as well, just as working at ESPN, whenever people try to take a stand against the social injustices that we see happening in the world is, you know, shut up and stick to sports, that kind of thing. And we're, we've seen it even happen here with Marcus Rashford, who, because he dared to stop children from going hungry 
people just said, just shut up and kick the ball. Just entertain me. Um, but we have still seen how it's only when the likes of you, the likes of Marcus Rashford, Raheem Sterling come out in the States, you see LeBron James constantly just being brave enough to not hold his tongue, um, you know, lead NBA players off. And we use the NBA as almost like such a focal point for what should be done sometimes. Um, why do you think sports is just such a, a perfect, I suppose, I, I guess, vehicle in this fight? Because everybody loves sports, don't they? I mean, in England, it's, it's literally, a, it more, it's more or less our religion, isn't it? And if you look at the likes of Colin Kaepernick, he was way ahead of the game. You know, he was taking the knee from three or four years ago and he was completely ostracized during that time. Now, I'm not saying that I've, I'm Colin Kaepernick, but I know exactly how that feels mm -hmm. to be, you know, to tell the truth and to be made to feel like you're the one that's in the wrong. And that's literally what happened to me and any other Maluka with the FA situation. You know, we told the truth and we were made to feel like we were in the wrong. But I do think when it comes to sports, everybody loves sports. Footballers are often held on a completely different pedal stool, right or wrong. You know, footballers sometimes can't do anything right. Or, and, and because of the, people often think about the money that they have. But I do think that in America, people do take a stand more. I think that with regards to with their teammates, I think there's more empathy. And obviously, America is a much bigger country. But I think that when it comes to sports, I just think it's a place where people can go and they should feel comfortable and they should be, feel like they can relate to players. Because whether somebody's black, white, mixed race, you know, Asian, it shouldn't matter. That is somebody that they look up to and that's something should stand. But it should be also go away from the sporting arena. Think people should think about the wordings that they use because I've been at games before and people have actually said homophobic things and I don't even think they realize. And that comes down mm -hmm. to education because for me, I'm like, how can you not realize what you're saying is offensive? And yeah. it puts me in a difficult situation because then I'm like, I should go and report them to the, to the person, but then they don't think they're being offensive. But I can't sit there and have a, an hour chat about how uneducated they are. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. but it comes down to lack of education starting in the school system, having these conversations about race, gender, sexism and stuff like that. And it can educate the children so that they can grow and they can realize that it can't happen. You, you mentioned Colin Kaepernick, Leanne, and, and um, him being ahead of his time four and a half years ago. Uh, we've seen the Premier League players take a knee, wear the Black Lives Matter patches on, on, on their arms. Now, I've, I've heard both sides of, of, of the argument from people I, I have immense respect for about continuing to take the knee or we, we, we need to we need to stop now what, what's your opinion on the act and what's next yeah I think in for many many years a lot of the players have often worn t-shirts we've seen you know kick racism out of football you wear a t-shirt just for one day and then you kind of don't really know what it stands for and then you just go home what I like about taking a knee is that I think it's quite powerful because I think the black players feel like they're unified and there's no longer a separation. And I think that what are the solutions? Because I've heard certain teams have not taken a knee and they say, well, you know, it's just taking a knee, it's wearing a badge. But what if you don't have a, a solution to the problem, then what are we supposed to do? I do think it's really powerful when you see the players, you know, taking a knee, closing their eyes, feeling like they're not alone. Is it going to continue for the next five years? I don't think that's reasonably possible, but I do think it's good that it's continuing. I really do. But at the end of the day, what more can people do? Yes, it's more than wearing a badge on your, on your, I wear one and I absolutely proudly wear one and I'll continue to wear one, even if the campaign's not going, but what is the solution? You know, Shaka, what is the solution to the issue mm -hmm. that there is at hand? People need to realize that this can't go on. And I do think that in the last six months, people do realize what we've been through. I think it's been very powerful. I really do. Because I think, like I said, when people don't want to take a knee, I would have a hard time. I genuinely would. I respect absolutely everybody's opinion, 100%, just to make that first and foremost. But if I'm on a team where people are not taking a knee, I'm going to be in the dressing room thinking, what is going on here? I, don't, mm. I feel like you're going against me. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen on a US Women's National Team. And I know all those girls, 99% of them, have nothing against any of them. They're good friends of mine. But if I saw a teammate of mine, not taking a knee, I would find that quite hard. Mm -hmm. mm. No, I, I completely agree with, with that one as well. And then now just bringing it um, to the Premier League as well. I think you came back home, of course, because of COVID, just right at the perfect time where the wheels started churning about what can something like the Premier League do on the back of what we were seeing, especially going on in the USA. Um, 
how happy are you with what we've seen so far and, and how much more needs to be done? Because as we understand, I mean, all three of us understand that we've probably been trying to fight this individually, internally on our own. Um, and you, of course, publicly way before this happened. So we know it's not going to be fixed overnight. Uh, we're not going to suddenly educate and eradicate all of racism overnight. But um, how happy are you with it, at least suppose this season now that we're halfway through? Yeah, I think for me personally, it's good to not feel alone because I think sometimes when I've spoken out, I've been considered a rebel or something yeah. like that when I'm actually just speaking out because that's what you should do when something's not correct. It's not because you're a rebel, it's just because of how it is. So for me personally, as I'm sure for all of us, it's quite draining, isn't it, talking about this? Because it's something that brings, it triggers you, it brings things up from years and years of stuff we spoke about at the beginning of the show, being followed around the shop and stuff like that. Like, you just learn to deal with it. But the good thing about it now is that I feel like people understand what it feels to walk a day in the life of people like us. And that makes me feel quite good about myself to know. It shouldn't have taken uh, the murdering of George Floyd for that to be the case. But we have to see the progression that's been made. And I do think people have woken up. Unfortunately, you can't change people like, with things they're going to say on social media, you can eradicate them by getting them off of those platforms, but you can't change them. But I think we do have to be positive, a little bit positive about where we've come in this time, because I do see a difference and I do see a change. And even when I put my TV on, I do see more people that look like me and it feels great. Mm. It does feel great. Uh, I think that, that, that's so important. If, if you can't see it, you, you can't be it, is, is your cliche in terms of, in terms of representation. And, um, and that, that's important, regardless of, of, of who you are, uh, how you identify, recognizing yourself on, on that television screen, um, on, that, on that field is, is an important stride forward. And, and one, Leanne, that, that you represent so well in, in so many different ways and, and with the integrity and, and, the, uh, and, and the strength and, and the bravery that you do it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you. I was going to say, I mean, for a woman, you've got the cojones, which is what I absolutely, <laughs> I absolutely love. And I, and I think that's definitely something that I suppose, I mean, we've spoken to a couple of footballers already, you know, ab about this. And um, I know a couple of them that have shied away from talking about this. And it's not because I don't think that they have the strength to, but because it, it's funny because we spoke to Anton Ferdinand about this a couple of weeks ago. And it brings it back to the point that you just brought up how he was the victim in a racist mm -hmm. incident and somehow he got all the abuse as if well, you know, it's funny i know anton i know anton really well and i actually did a show of him last week and when i watched his documentary it really triggered me i was yeah. actually crying because it made me i completely you know when someone says i know how you feel sometimes people don't they just say it yeah. i genuinely felt him because i was thinking but the difference is and my dad made this point to me the other day i dealt with it there and then he's not dealt with it there and then, but we both still felt the same. Yeah. Do, do, you know, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? So there's no right or wrong. And I completely understand why he didn't deal with it there and then necessarily because he's a professional footballer in amongst a professional environment where they're kind of shutting him down when he's trying to do anything about it. Whereas I almost had to, like, I haven't retired, but I almost had to remove myself from those situations to be able to have a voice. And thankfully now I'm on TV shows. I'm able to speak freely and just be myself as opposed to when I'm playing in England or when I'm on a team, they say, you know, it's such like, you can and can't say this, don't yeah. do this, don't do that. They're putting up a board after a game saying bullet point, don't say this. And, and that's hard for me because I'm an adult. So I just think that with regards to Anton as well, like he's also brave coming out now, but it makes me sad how much it's impacted his mental health because you can see it in him. And that really upset me because I completely know how he was feeling because for about a year before myself and Eliana Raluca went to the House of Commons to deal with the situation, Everybody was saying we were liars. And that was horrible. Mm -hmm. So imagine, like, I'm crying at night time. Those, those are the things that people don't see. Those are the things that people don't see. So, you know, yes, it, 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 I'm, I feel like I'm a strong person, but I'm also a human. <laughs> so yeah. I, 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 it affects me as well, you know? Listen, I, I think those traumas are very real, um, whether you recognize it in the moment or, or after the fact. Just kind of having spent you know, the, the, the number of years that I did in, in those environments, you, you, at times when, it, when it's happening, um, you want to feel, well, you know, I have to take it. I'm, I'm strong enough. I have to, I have to prove my alphaness, if, 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 if that's a word. And it's only, and I'll speak personally here. 
it, it's only after you retire, um, I think you start to recognize recognize some of those traumas. And and for me, that that certainly has been the case, and that that, that certainly has been the case over the last twelve months. Which is is, is why again I, I am I am I give so much credit to the Rashford, the Greenwoods, the Sterlings of dealing with these issues in real time. One, it benefits them long term personally in not having to relive these traumas later on, as, as so many so many of us from, from pre- previous generations have done. But it highlights the issue and it brings it to the forefront. And it forces us as a community to deal with them there and then in trying to make things better for the next young black footballer mm-hmm. coming up, for the next young woman footballer coming through who's playing in a boys team and, and having to deal um, with parents shouting obscenities from, from the sidelines. That, that, those, those, for me, are, are the big takeaways, but also recognising but, but, but Shaka as well, not to interrupt here. you, but you are also a trailblazer because I remember growing up watching you and there wasn't any black goalkeepers. And when you were playing <laughs> at Newcastle, it's true though. Like, and so we can see here and like, sometimes people often do work that doesn't get appreciated because times have moved on. There wasn't social media then, but it's true. I used to grow up watching Shaka on the TV. Unfortunately, I remember when you beat Man United 5 1, but we won't go there with that. But, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's true, that's, it's let's true. There are a lot of people, <laughs> there are a lot of people before me that have trailblazed the way and paved the way too. And hopefully, you know, we can pass on that baton to the future generation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Leanne, honestly, for just joining us for just for a chat just for events, just to share experiences, because this is the whole point of it. This is a conversation that needs to continuously be had, not just for everyone else's benefit to educate other races about some of our experiences, but also for us to, you know, as a way of healing and as a way of picking ourselves up and getting ready for the next day of fighting, because we know that this is a fight that's far from over, but I feel like we're definitely onto something special here. Liana, I'd like to, I'd like to double down on that and, and thank you for, on, on so many levels, for not just your time here, but your efforts. We spoke about we spoke about Gillette Stadium, but more to the point, for your continued efforts, your your honesty, speaking your truth, um, in recognizing how much this means, not just to young women footballers, not just to the LGBTQ community, but so many of of, of our of our marginalized peoples who continue to struggle from day to day, and and recognizing who you are, the strength that you bring, the truth that you bring, and the effect that it will have for, for a long time. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. It's not often I'm left speechless, but you're making me want to, um, you're making me get emotional. Jeez. No, no, <laughs> no, honestly, thank you. Uh, it There's really means no a lot. We see you. We no, see it you. means a lot to me, because I think sometimes people don't often tell me, you know, I, my mum and dad do, my friends do, but it means a lot coming from you guys, so I appreciate that. I really do. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+.